This episode is made possible by the generosity of our listeners. Thank you. Welcome to the Creation Science for Kids show. We have been reading through the saddest part of all human history. Now it's time to finally get a ray of hope, and it's a laser beam pointed right at our enemy. Join us as we look at the promise God made to our first parents by letting them hear Him tell Satan, even though it seems he had just won, he will one day be utterly destroyed. Then we turn to some unusual and fascinating animals: lobsters and snakes. Praise the Lord! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is His work, and His righteousness endures for ever. He has caused His wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Psalm one eleven verses one through four. This is episode seventy-seven of the podcast where we learn about Jesus, our Creator, and His amazing world. Hi, I'm Sherry Fields, your host, and I'm joined today by my co-host Timothy. Hi, and Samuel. Hi. To follow along with what we're looking at, check out the show notes: Creation Science, the number four kids dot com slash lobster or zero seven seven. And be sure to listen to the end for the punny science joke of the day. All right, so we've been reading Genesis chapter three, and what is that whole chapter about?、Um, they sin. Yes, our first mother and father sin and plunge the whole human race into the mess that we have been ever since. Eve has listened to the serpent, Satan, and she ate and gave to her husband, and he's eaten. Now God is talking to them, and He has some very important things to say. Right now, God has been talking to Satan and telling him that he will crawl on his belly, which we know refers both that he will be humiliated and also that snakes will. Be crawling on their bellies and eating dust. We discussed that last time. Now we go on to verse fifteen. Would you read this for us, please, Samuel? And I will put the enemy between. Wait, wait, wait! Slow down. And I will put. Do you know that word? Enmity. Uh huh. Say that again faster. Enmity、mm -hmm. between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt burst. Bruise. Bruise his heel. Okay, so there was a new word in there, wasn't there? What word do you not know what it means? Enmity. <laughs> Enmity. Now you know a word very similar. Can you guess what word we you do know that's very similar to enmity? Enemy. That's right, and that's exactly what this means. Enemies feel enmity toward each other. So it's just an、uh, old-fashioned word.、Um, nowadays, we would probably say enemies. What's the feeling they have toward each other? Hey, right, and that's exactly what enmity means. So God is saying, "I will put hatred between you, Satan, the serpent, and the woman." Okay, so this is interesting. I was looking up what people had to say about this, and in Blue Letter Bible, one of the commentators that I especially appreciate. So, for you grown-ups, this is worth remembering. David Guzik, G U Z I K, does a good job when he covers verses that he'll pull in all different resources and kind of have a collection. And I frequently find things that he is drawing out that I'd not thought about before. So he points out if you look earlier in the chapter, how was Satan interacting with Eve? Was he being scary to her? No. No. How was he acting?、Mm -hmm. Remember, he told her, "Has God been mean to you? Has he told you you can't eat any fruit?" And then he said, "No, you won't die. You'll actually be like gods, and wouldn't that be wonderful?" So somebody who talks to you like that is trying to be、mm. 
If I tell you something you don't know, but if you go in the cupboard in the other room, there's a whole huge box of candy you can have all to yourself. Mm-hmm. I'm acting like your mm-hmm. enemy, friend. Friend. Yeah, Satan had gotten Eve to listen to him by acting as if he was a better friend to her than God was. But at this point, he's now been exposed. They know that actually what's going to happen is going to be horrible, and they're finding this out. And from this point on, Eve is not going to trust the serpent. Yes, the devil lies to us, and we listen far too often, but he always has to hide. Like a lot of times, we will have thoughts that we think are ours, and they feel like us, and we don't recognize that they're from Satan. But it's very rare, even for people who don't love God, to love and be friends with Satan. Most of humans ever since have hated and feared him. So I thought that was an important and very interesting point. Now, here's something very interesting. Who does God say, tell Satan he's putting enmity between? Between Satan and? The woman. Yeah. Do you find that odd? If you're reading this for the first time, who sinned? Who ate the fruit? The woman. Was she the only one? No. Her husband. Yeah? What's his name? Eve. No, that's her name. What's her husband's name? Adam. Adam. And by the way, this is Hope, our new co-host. You want to say hi? Hi. (laughs) All right. Yes. So Adam and Eve had eaten. And yet when God is talking to the serpent, he says it's specifically between thee and the woman. That's very interesting. We'll see more of it in the rest of the verse and see if you can figure out why God would just say her and not include her husband. And then it goes on, and between thy seed and her seed. Do you have any clue what that's talking about? I do. Hmm. Because they sinned. Right. That's why. What do you think seed, the serpent, um, mm-hmm. Satan's seed and her seed? What's going on there? Got any ideas? I know. They're going to be cursed. Who? I the know. Their seed. Okay. Well, no, that means they're going to be enemies. Mm -hmm. Because God is going to make them crawl on their bellies. Right. That's true. We already talked about it. Yes, the snakes crawl on their bellies. Okay, Samuel, you got any idea what the seed would be? All of its children. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then, so snakes and humans will not like each other. Well, that's certainly been true for the most part throughout time and space. But remember, this is also talking about Satan. So who do you think the seed of Satan would be? His followers. Mm -hmm. Can you think of anything that the Bible would suggest that that would be certainly a big part of what God is talking about here? How about what Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 44? He tells the Pharisees, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So, remember, when I'm teaching my younger children how to tell the truth all the time. I remind them that when you tell the truth, you are being like God. God. Jesus calls himself. I am the way, the truth. Right. And when somebody lies, they are being like Satan. Satan. And so you have a choice. You can either be like Jesus or like the devil. All right. So that would certainly be true. Now, this is kind of a big idea. But we have this in English as well, so it's actually fairly easy to understand what's going on with seed. Is it one seed or a bunch of seeds? In English, we can say a farmer plants seed in his field. Does that mean he plants a single wheat grain? No. No, it means he plants a single type of seed, lots and lots of them, bushels and bushels, thousands. So seed can be one or it can be a collective group. And you see that going on here. God can be very, very efficient with his word. Just as with DNA, he can have uh, messages that read forwards and backwards. He can say more than one thing at a time. So seed can easily be all the people who follow the devil and murder and lie. And it can also be a singular 
And we see that particularly with the seed of the woman. Yes, it can mean all humans won't like snakes and won't like Satan, but we also know there is a a single seed of a woman. And we see that with the crushing Satan's head. Are we powerful enough to crack Satan's head? No. No. Who is? God. Particularly? Jesus. Jesus. And now we get back to why it's important that God's talking about the woman. <coughs> How was Jesus born? What was different about his birth compared to everybody else's? He was born of a virgin. Which means what? Mm. He had a human mother, but who was his father? God. That's right. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and caused Jesus to be inside her tummy. He did not have a human father. He was the seed of the woman, but not of a man in the same way as all the rest. And there's a lot of、um, theology there about why Jesus would need to be a second Adam rather than the first. But we won't talk about that so much here. But that's why we can see way, way back in the garden, the very first day sin entered the world, God had already promised. And actually, it was a threat to Satan that a seed of the woman was going to squash and break Satan's head. Now, what about the thou shalt bruise his heel? What happened to Jesus in order for him to have the rights to the world to destroy Satan and to rescue us? What did Jesus have to do? He had to die. Yeah, and remember, he was put on a cross. And how do they fasten people on crosses? Nails. Nails. And there were nails where? In his feet. Yeah. And we've actually seen where、um, somebody who didn't get resurrected left their skeleton behind and still has the nail right through the ankle bone. So, this in a very compact way that Satan wouldn't have been able to figure out what God was talking about. God knew exactly what he was saying, and we can see it very, very clearly. So, I've got two verses that talk about this, both what Jesus did on the cross and what is still coming. In Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15 are two very, very cool verses. I'm going to read it in the ESV because then I don't have to explain it as much. So, this is what Jesus did by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. That's our sin. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame. It's talking about Satan and his demons by triumphing over them in him. So that's what happened on the cross. Jesus conquered. He put Satan to open shame by taking our sins and nailing it to the cross. And then Revelation 20, verse 10, talks about what's going to happen in the future. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. I talked about how you can have the collective with all the people who follow、um, the devil can be his seed. And we've got all of us who are the seed of the woman, don't like snakes. And then there's Jesus. So we're not entirely sure because it's in the future. But we do know Satan has one particular person he's going to work through. And Revelation talks about it quite a bit called the beast. There's one place where he is called the Antichrist. And that's one person that Satan uses very much the way. God has three parts. Satan kind of makes his own fake trinity. So you have the devil in Revelation 20, verse 10, and he joins the beast and the false prophet. And we know the beast has a wound that looks like he's died. So it's very much a fake twist of who Jesus is. So that seems to me the most likely what the singular seed of Satan would be that there's enmity. But anyway, you can see there's a whole lot packed into that one verse, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, people will often call this verse the Proto Evangelium, first evangel or the first gospel, where God is giving them hope. Yes, it looks terrible. Yes, you've got an enemy now, but Satan will be crushed by someone who is a descendant of Eve. And that is something that we still, now we know who he is. We find our great hope in knowing that this is true and God kept his promise.
Now, we're going to change gears totally. We've actually got two animals, but I was looking through the Acts and Facts magazine from the Institute for Creation Research a while back, and I thought this article on lobsters was so cool. I wanted to share with you guys. Acts and Facts is an awesome publication by ICR. They've been putting out for free for decades. It's beautiful. It's not very long. But all you have to do is ask for it. You can read it online. I like the paper version, so I don't have to be by my computer to read it. And a lot of it can get kind of technical, but they always have some articles that are fun. And certainly, if you can put it, you parents can put it in your own words for kids. There's always something that's going to be interesting, like what we're going to show you about lobsters changing their skins. So when you grow, how do you get new skin? Um, you lose it? Yeah, it's constantly growing. Do you have to shed like a snake? No, because we get our old bodies off and get our new bodies on. Really? Yeah. When do you do that? When you take a bath? We die on a cross. Uh, well, hopefully not on a cross. Okay. No. So we're mammals. We have bones on the inside, and when we grow... Every once in a while, you might get growing pains, but the ends of your bones just grow without you thinking about it, especially if you noticed in the summer, you often get bigger, but you don't have to think about it. And except for getting new clothes, that's all you have to do. It's not that way for lobsters. Lobsters do not have bones. How do they stay safe and keep their bodies in shape so they're not like squashy jellyfish? They're claws. Well, their claws have squishy muscles on the inside. So how do their claws stay in shape? Um, Where are they hard? The place where you get grabbed? (laughs) All over. I know. Hmm. Because those are pinchers. Right. So, But that's not the only part of their body that's hard. Their whole body is hard. Where? Which part? Down deep in their bones? No. No. Their shell. Yeah, they have a shell. The whole outside of them is hard. It's called an exoskeleton, which means skeleton on the outside, exo. So when they grow, the hard stuff that doesn't want to move and change shape is outside of them. This article by James Johnson, THD, is talking about what happens when it's time for them to grow and get a new shell. So here's what they have to do. And this is true for anything with an exoskeleton. Timothy, you have been studying about snakes. How do they get a new skin? Because they have to do this sort of too, even though they have bones on the inside. Where does the new skin grow? On the inside. Yeah. Way down deep in the middle? No. On the outside. Um, On the outside of the old shell? No. No. Where? On the inside. Way down deep? No. Where? Well, if it's not on the outside of the old shell, and it's not way down deep in the middle, where else could it grow? Near the shell that they're going to lose. Right. So it grows right on the outside, just inside the old shell. So in order for that to work, it has to be really, really super soft. And here's something cool I did not know. So lobsters have their big claws. They also have little legs. And sometimes those will get broken off or eaten or something. And they can actually regrow the limbs on the inside, just tucked up in there because there's no space on the outside for them until it's time for their new shell. So they do a lot of work on the inside, getting things ready, but it's all soft and squashy. Then when it's time for them to break out of their old shell, they actually will drink a whole bunch of water puffing them up so that it's kind of like a water balloon swelling up and putting a lot of pressure. And there's a special seam you can see on the picture here that's right behind their head and opens out enough for them to squeeze out almost like their old shell is a tube of toothpaste and they are squeezing out. So that's how they get out. But guess, what do you think the lobster is like right after it comes out? softer Mm -hmm. and it's dangerous so they have to try to find a place that's safe i thought it was cool that uh, female lobsters will do this right when it's time for them to mate and their mate will actually watch over and keep them safe while they're soft and i thought that was very chivalrous of the male lobsters to do for them 
then it takes about two hours for them to harden. So one of the things that Mr. Johnson here was saying is that you've got so many different things that have to be in place and have to work just right to help the lobster. Um, like one of the things, not only does it get new limbs, but if it's had cuts and breaks in its old shell, once it comes out of the new one, will look all beautiful and healthy again. And it's almost like it's got a new body. But he's pointing out that everything has to work just right, one step after another, all in order. Otherwise, what happens to the lobster? It dies. Right. Either it dies if it can't get out of its old shell, if something goes wrong there. And certainly if it gets out and it's not in a safe location, doesn't know what's going on, it's going to get eaten. So we see God taking care of the lobster, giving it a cool way to repair its body and to grow and still have its safe shell by developing a new one on the inside. So it shows us how wise and caring our creator is by how he designed the lobster. Now, this is something I love to point out. Is the lobster smart enough to figure out how to make its own shell with all those moving pieces, like the tail, how it's like a suit of armor with all the plates? Is it smart enough to figure out how to make that? No. No. It's like me when I had babies in my stomach. There's no way I was smart enough to put that baby in together myself. All I had to do was eat and sleep and take my vitamins and rest and... The lobster shows it is not nearly smart enough to do this, and yet it can do these amazing things that take brilliance, and we know they're like that because evolution? No, God. Yes, and God did what for the lobster? Made them. Yeah, and he designed them, and he thought of everything they would need, and he thinks of everything we need, too. All right, now it's time to hear from you. What do you have for us today, Timothy? Snakes. are scary, cool, and they can hide. Okay. All right. So we all know what snakes are. They're lizards with no legs. So what do you mean by hide? They can, like, dig a little hole. Hmm. With what? They don't have any arm or legs. They're like drills without pointy stuff. Okay. So they use their tail? No, they use your head to burrow under the ground. Cool. Do you know of any snake species that do that? No. Okay. Yeah, because I'm thinking of like rattlesnakes. They will hide under leaves, but I didn't know they burrowed. I thought they borrowed other animals' burrows to hide in. Yeah, they do that. Okay. All right. What kind of notes do you have on snakes? That there are more than 3,500 species These are types of snakes. Wow. And also snakes don't have ears like we do. Uh Uh-huh. They have jaws that can sense vibrations. Yeah, I was helping you research on that. And in fact, this is something that they've scientists haven't been sure how it works. They knew they didn't have ears, and yet they can respond to sounds. Do you remember reading about that report? What did they do to figure out how and what snakes hear? They tested low, medium, and high frequencies. Mm -hmm. And then soft and loud sounds. Mm -hmm. And how do they tell what mechanisms the snakes are using to hear? They put something up to their jaw. Yeah, they did. They put little speaker vibration things up against, yeah, stuck them on their jaw. That was one thing. And what was the other thing they tried to see if they could hear through the air like we do? They just used... Um... Speakers suspended in the air. Yeah. So what did they find out? That they can sense vibrations. Right. And they are very good at sensing low vibrations. Right. So even, yeah, even through the air. And that's probably because those low vibrations, you can kind of feel it. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) And what do we know? because we see them respond to it out in the world, when they're on the ground and something else is like a little mouse is running around. They can hear it. 
Right, because of the vibration. So that's really mm-hmm. cool. They don't mm-hmm. hear music and stuff the way we do, but they can hear through their jawbones. In mm-hmm. fact, um, have you ever heard using just vibrations? Mm. Okay, long time ago, I was at a museum and it had an exhibit on our body and our senses. And they had where you could listen to the radio when you were standing right near it, but not touching this plate, you couldn't hear a thing. But you put your jaw, that worked best because your jaw is so close to our ears. And when you, I put my chin on this plate, all of a sudden I could hear the radio playing and I could hear music and I could hear talking. And as soon as you weren't touching the plate, the sound was gone. It was really weird. And one of the things that we knew about snakes, because that, you don't have to have them alive, even though they don't have ears, they do have cochlea, just like we do this snail-like shaped things that collect sounds. They do have those. So we knew they had a way of hearing, even though they don't have proper ears. So that's very cool about snakes. What's next? That there are two classes of snakes. There are venomous and constrictors. Okay. The venomous have venom Mm -hmm. that goes through their fangs, Mm -hmm. and then they use that to kill their prey, and then they swallow it. Right. Yeah, they all swallow whole. Uh Uh-huh. And the constrictors? They constrict. They squeeze. Right. Yeah. Like a tight hug. Mm -hmm. I remember I was studying about the black mamba, and it's a venomous snake. So it's six feet long, two meters long. But it only weighs two pounds, a kilogram. Yeah. But a constrictor at the same length would be way, way heavier because of all those muscles. Mm-hmm. And um, black mambas are known for being very, they'll attack easily. But you mm-hmm. think about it. If you're a skinny little beanpole, like a pencil, and you know you could be hurt and killed very, very easily, then you would be scared too, wouldn't you? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Then there are some snakes Mm -hmm. that don't have any fangs. Sure. So which group would they be in? The constrictors. Right. So that's how they survive. Okay. Some snakes use venom to paralyze their prey. Okay. Instead of? Killing it slowly or quickly. Okay. It just makes you them snap. Or freeze. Yeah, freeze. Uh Uh-huh. And then they can eat it, and they're just as dead as if they died first. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad there aren't snakes that do that to me. Hmm. All right. Some snakes have 585 vertebrae. Yeah. Wow. What's a vertebrae? A vertebrae is that weird (laughs) thingy in your back. (laughs) Thingy? Yeah. Be more specific. It's like your backbone. Right. It's an individual piece of your backbone. So it's one of the bones that makes yeah. up a backbone. 585. Wow. I forget how many we have. It's something like 25 or 30. 32. But do we have 32? Okay, good. So 585. That's a lot of individual bones in their backbone. Huh. And then the snake scales mm-hmm. are the same material as our fingernails. Right. Do you remember what that's called? Um, keratin. keratin. And what's it made out of? Is it bone? Mm, yeah. No. No? It doesn't have calcium in it. Otherwise, it'd be hard. A white. It's made out of protein. Protein. Yep. All right. That's cool because I didn't hadn't realized it was made of fingernail stuff. And then some snakes can slither up trees. Right. They can climb the trees. Mm-hmm. And some constrictors can climb up trees and and their climbing is like constricting, except they don't squeeze. They just so, go round and round and the round. The trunk? And yeah, cool. and go up. Very cool. Hmm. Yeah, I know I like uh, when you go to the zoo, there's um, a green tree python. Uh-huh. And they'll often be draped back and forth over a branch with its head facing out. And they look so pretty. It's like, I'm glad you're behind the glass, but you are very pretty there, Mr. Snake. Okay. Some snakes can jump really, really far. Mm -hmm. Jump, huh? Yeah. Like 10 feet? Some snakes can jump up to 25 feet. Okay. You sure? I think so. Okay. So what are they actually doing? If you jump... I just go. 
doing and yeah. fly six, <laughs> no, eight feet. Yeah, you push yourself forward and then you come back down as soon as gravity. Is that what's happening with these snakes? No. What do they do extra? They spread out their rib cage. Uh huh. And they kind of flatten themselves so they can glide. They can yeah. Go. There are other gliders like um, the flying squirrel and mm-hmm. different things can spread out. So there's a, there are snakes that can do that too. That's really cool. So they would probably live like in a rainforest or something with lots of trees. Mm-hmm. Okay. And some snakes can strike their prey faster than you can blink. Wow. And you can blink in 200 milliseconds. Okay. And the snake can attack in 50 to 100 milliseconds. Wow. That's crazy fast. Mm-hmm. And milk snakes are a type of king snake. Okay. Now, why did you pick that? Because you don't have that many individual snakes on your report. Why did you pick the milk snake? Because I didn't know that it was a type of king snake. Why? I thought king snakes were all venomous. Oh, no. No, king snakes aren't. They don't bother people. And they actually make very good neighbors for people. And how did you know about the milk snake? I've seen some. Mm-hmm. Where? At a campground. Okay. I've also seen them on my dad's farm. I wasn't sure at that time whether it was a rattler, because we do have one kind of rattlesnake in Michigan. But when I researched, mm-hmm. it's like the colors are way too bright. And milk snakes, what do they eat? Do you know? No. Lots of little animals, so they're great at keeping down the mouse population. So every farmer loves milk snakes. Okay. What's your favorite kind of snake? The anaconda. It's huge. Mm -hmm. Like how big? The biggest ones Mm -hmm. alive right now are 30 feet long. Wow. That's crazy. That's like as long as a house. Yeah. Yeah. And what class of snake are they in? They're in the constrictors. Right. So they could easily constrict you. Yeah, they could probably just break anyone's bone in less than two mm-hmm. seconds. Well, I don't know about that, but yes. And then the last interesting thing about snakes. Snakes lay eggs, mm-hmm. and some snakes keep the eggs in mm-hmm. their belly until they're born. Yeah, it's interesting because snakes are not mammals. They do not make milk. They do not have live young the way we do with placentas and all, but they'll keep the eggs inside their tummies. So when it comes out, you'd think they were delivering a baby just like a mammal does. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Would you want a snake for a pet? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And are you glad God made snakes? Yes. Yeah. Especially in this world where we've got plenty of rodents and lots of things that could take over the world and bring disease and eat all our food. Snakes serve a very important role, Mm. like other predators, at keeping everything in balance. forget you can find links to all the things we've talked about today by visiting our show notes page creation science the number four kids dot com slash lobster to let your friends know about this podcast and ministry and to connect with all the rest of the things we do with the podcast, stop by the web address I got just for you, cs4ks, the initials of the show, dot com, and find out how to send us your own recording. Write us an Apple Podcast review, drop us a note, become a monthly supporter, and see the heart of why this ministry is so important. Running this podcast and ministry isn't free, plus it takes a lot of time. We have a Patreon account where you can help us out, like Pastor Brian Betworth and the Academy of Christian Apologetics for Moms. Thank you. If just a few of our listeners help, even with just a dollar a month, it will help cover the rest of our basic expenses, and anything above that will help us improve things for the future. Visit cs4ks.com to find out how you can get involved. All right. Now it's time for our joke. What kinds of snakes are good at mathematics? Um, I don't know. Adders. Oh, uh-huh.
Well, this finishes our show for today. Until next time, have fun treasuring our amazing universe and creator. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou has created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelation 4.11